So my name is Michael Hebb, and I'm the founder of EOL and Death Over Dinner, and I'm here with my dear friend, Dr. Sylvia Perez-Proto. You want to say hi? Hi, everyone. I'm here, Sylvia, from Cleveland Clinic. So this is our second town hall. Um, we had an incredible one last month, and we'll continue in November, take a break in December, and be back in January. Um, but the reason that we created this town hall um, was actually inspired by a panel that Sylvia and I um, and Patty Webster from The Conversation Project, um, Ferdinando Mariachi from uh, Midio, um, and Alexandra Drain were on um, for the American Telemedicine Association. And we started to talk about the advancements in technology for end-of-life care. And we realized that there were so many incredible advancements for clinicians and for families and for caregivers um, that it merited an entire town hall series um, to start out monthly and then eventually be quarterly. So that's why we're here. We know that clinicians are incredibly busy um, and caregivers are incredibly um, busy and often overwhelmed. And it's hard to um, stay um, at the cutting edge or stay in touch with all of the incredible new tools and technologies that are available to you um, to make your life better and easier. Um, some technology doesn't do that, um, but we like to highlight some incredible founders that have built technologies that actually do make our life better and are focused on reducing suffering in the world. So that's why what this is, um, this town hall is about. Um, and we have three incredible founders. Um, we have Mandy from Keeper and Talk Death and Mike from Carely and the whole Carely family of of apps and platforms. Um, and we have Jethro from Common Practice, um, well known for his very influential game, Hello. Um, and what we have is a really great uh, spectrum today um, that um, includes early conversations and planning um, with the Hello game. Um, and now they're working on a virtual Hello game that we get to hear about. Um, it includes um, Mike and Carly when it comes to actually taking care of somebody who um, is, in, is in need, um, somebody who is, um, you know, uh, needs a caregiving team around them. So whether that's at end of life or at any time in, of um, their life when they um, are experiencing a hard time. And then Mandy um, and Keeper and her um, platform that allows for pre-need planning, but also to take care of people um, and families after there has been a death. And this is something that is woefully neglected in the healthcare and medical space is considering the continuum of care as something that extends all the way beyond um, a loss, beyond a death, um, into memorialization, funerals, bereavement, and grief. Um, and, and I really want us to include um, those leaders and those solutions in this conversation. So we're thrilled that Mandy is here. I'm going to turn it to Sylvia, uh, my friend, just to give us, before we dig in, um, why don't you give us an update on how things are at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, you're in, you know, running one of the, or, you know, the End of Life Center for such an extraordinary healthcare organization during definitely the most wild and extraordinary time that we could have ever imagined. Yes, so I think the pandemic has shown everyone that uh, having the conversation, being prepared, having advanced care planning is, is very important. So I am working a lot now in many pilots in different settings uh, for COPD patients, for uh, surgical patients, on how to have the conversation uh, starting with us and, and is, uh, try to help patients to start the conversation about and among the family. So I think that uh, has increased the awareness of the need for this. Um, and new things like, you know, in this pandemic, we have many people have lost their uh, homes, for example. So the clinic has uh, prepared a, pro a program where we can discharge our COVID patients there when they don't have home. I, I just received a patient three weeks ago homeless with COVID. 
So, you know, we have been um, um, confronting such suffering in our communities that uh, working uh, tireless and having processes and programs to help everyone in this pandemic. So, um, again, these, uh, all these tools are very exciting to learn in order to see what we can use here and, and show to everyone to be able to use them as well. Well, I want to, you know, once again, as always, thank you and the Cleveland Clinic for being such an incredible leader in this space, willing to have an end of life center, willing to have these important discussions. Sylvia and I um, were uh, able to create the healthcare edition of Death Over Dinner together um, and to launch that in partnership with the Cleveland Clinic and some extraordinary partners like Memorial Sloan Kettering and the Henry Ford Health System, et cetera. Um, but yeah. Um, well, before we start, I'll give a quick update on things over at EOL. Um, so EOL is the host, one of your hosts today. And for those of you who aren't familiar with um, EOL or the End of Life Collective, it's a brand new platform that launched um, August 5th. We launched our beta edition August 5th. And we call it um, beta even though there is a lot there. Um, and there's just a few things that we want to perfect before we call it a full launch. Um, but I'm going to show um, everyone just to f just give you literally the one minute tour of EOL before um, we turn over to um, Mike and hear about the exciting world of Carole. Um So very quickly. Um, so EOL um, is free. Um, it's free for users, for families, for providers. Um, and there are a lot of things on this platform. Um, there are planning tools for an individual or a family to create an end of life plan. There are events like this one. Um, there, and the URL is just eol.community. We'll share that out. Um, there is an immense amount of content from leaders like Lucy Kalanithi and Frank Ostaseski and um, people you wouldn't expect like Jose Andres and Tim Ferriss. Um, I don't have time to go into all of it. Um, there's an incredible event coming up um, on October 24th um, that we are also partnering with the Cleveland Clinic on. And we are partnering with Disney um, and Justin Baldoni. Um, the new, Disney's new film Clouds comes out this weekend and we're gonna host a screening next weekend um, and a panel discussion with Justin Baldoni, Adrian Boise from the Cleveland Clinic and myself and a number of par partners. We would love anyone who's in um, listening today to join as a partner organization. We want as many healthcare organizations, leaders, clinicians um, to be able to attend this conversation and really connect this moment where mainstream culture is thinking about, because of this movie, is thinking about what it means to get a terminal diagnosis um, as a 17 year old, as a teenager, and how. Um, this remarkable kid, Zach, lived um, his last, um, the last amount of his life. Um, beautiful film, um, lots of things on EOL, hundred, actually 500 providers already in the marketplace. You can come in and ask questions and you're met by experts in the field. Um, so that's literally your nickel tour <laughs> of EOL. Um, and now we get to turn to some of our favorite providers that we're um, featuring on EOL, starting with Mike from Carely. I'm gonna turn it over to you, sir, and you're wonderful. Like this, this man looks like um, he's been hosting podcasts with uh, Larry King. Um, so it's, it's all you, Mike. Thanks, Michael, appreciate it, man. So I should be able to share my screen. Let me do that now. There we go. Okay, well, hey, thanks for inviting us to be a part of this. As you know, we've been supporters of EOL for a while, excited to see the updates. Um, we'll absolutely reach out after this and, and definitely want to participate in raising awareness about the clouds premiere. I think that sounds super exciting. Um, but, but I wanted to give everybody, and as Michael asked, just to give a background on Carolee, um, you know, if, you've, if you are familiar with us at all, um, you've noticed via our social media or whatever other channels we've been sort of present on that a lot of change has been um, 
in the air for our company and our brand and sort of what we've been doing. And, and a lot of that really has stemmed from um, the success we've had over the past four or five years, um, uh, just with Carolee and, and sort of our initial products. But I want to just give you a background of those and, and sort of stay high level, but to give you a sense of who we are and who we support. So when you look at Carolee today, um, what you're seeing is sort of the the evolution of eight years that all really began with a personal experience. So my family um, was was very much the inspiration for the work that I do today and continues to be uh, as we move forward into our future. But really, when you think about Carolee, um, our direct to consumer sort of origins are present in everything we do today from product design to um, feature building to everything. Um, that experience with my family really was the cause of all that. And, and it, drilling down, it was my family's inability to communicate around my great grandmother that really led me to sort of down this path. Um, and so when we started off the company eight years ago, it was a direct to consumer product. So Carely, the Carely family app, which is still very much a big part of what we do today, um, was, was sort of our, our stepping off point. Um, and it was direct to, direct to family caregivers. Uh, we focused on consumer design. That product looks and feels very much like um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you name it. And, and that's by design. You know, we wanted to create a product for caregivers that was very familiar. Um, also that sort of met the standard that a lot of native mobile apps have created. That bar is fairly high from a user experience standpoint. So we knew that any product we put out on the market direct to consumers really had to stack up compared to what they were used to using. So when you think of the, the family app, essentially what we're doing is we're enabling a family to really efficiently communicate who saw mom last, who's going to see her next, how those vids went. Um, we've had success with the app really, really broadly um, from families who are caring for, you know, a child in, in an IDD situation to I mean, more stereotypically with a loved one in like a long-term care community um, and, and quite a bit in hospice and end of life settings where you've got a lot of family members, a lot of support, you know, coming to the table to offer and help and um, want to be a part and want to be on the same page. So we're really catering to that audience in a big way. Um, you know, that focus on design, we were sort of validated last year or this year, I should say, um, uh, we were actually named as one of Apple's apps we love right now by their editors, which again, primarily because of the design work and, and sort of the usability of the apps. We're really proud of that product and what it does for folks. But when we talk about the evolution, starting off as a consumer product, after about three years of being in that market and that market alone, one of the interesting things that happened for Carly as an organization was we got a ton of inbound interest from an industry that we knew nothing about, and that was long-term care. So right around 2016, um, we started having a lot of organizations reach out to us, whether it was a hospice organization, a home health, a you know, SNF or um, assisted living or skilled nursing building. And they would reach out and they'd say, hey, families are using your app in our building. How do we use it? And sort of that got us now thinking about, okay, well, what can we do as a product, as a software company to really enable these organizations, which, which seemingly have a need for communication and, and efficient sort of connection and engagement with families? How can we help them? How can we bring them into the fold, bring them into what we've done over here on the family app side? So right around 2016, 2017, we set out on that mission to develop that side of our business. And that's really where you see Carely, um, Carely Inc. start to sort of form. Um, we, we, we created a product called Carely Community, which is what you're looking at now on the screen. And that really sort of caters to that enterprise um, audience. So it's a tool that long-term care organizations, healthcare organizations more broadly can use to connect with families in the family app. So it's sort of a two-way street. I can share stuff. I can share updates about your loved one. You can communicate back to me as a family, that sort of thing. That was incredibly successful. Um, you know, take out the last six months where our adoption rates have gone through the roof because of COVID and sort of 
the need for transparency and added communication of families has you know quadrupled. Um, but even prior to that, you know, we had little under a thousand locations all across the U.S. and even into uh, Canada and, and even some in the U.K. adopting our product and, and sort of paying for that solution. We found success in a big way as a software company, and we're really proud of that. But one of the things I really want to emphasize here is while we were happy about what we had done and the business we had created, I think at the end of 2019, as a team, we were looking at the impact we were having and we were feeling sort of, you know, deflated in a way because when we started this business and we set out on this path, our goal was to really broadly help caregivers, you know, all 60 million or so family caregivers that exist sort of in one way or another in the U S we wanted to help those folks. And while we had built a really amazing product and, and, and an ecosystem that was thriving, we felt a little bit um, uh, let down by the fact that we just weren't able to reach more people. So in the end of 2019, we had decided that we were going to spend a lot of 2020 focusing on our consumer products, focusing on our website and creating a brand that could extend much further out into families' lives and really drive support for family caregivers, whether or not they use our app. And so... We were fortunate enough through some of our relationships that in uh, February of this year, um, Denise Brown, who was the founder of caregiving.com, she had reached out. We were already working on a partnership with her and she had suggested that we, we acquire her site um, and really sort of enable that to become sort of our direct to caregiver tool. So when you look at caregiving today, um, we finalized that ac acquisition of caregiving.com in April um, we made the announcement uh, in, in August, um, but today this is what the Carely Inc. ecosystem looks like. Um, so we've got the Carely family app, which has got somewhere in any given day about 20,000 families all across the world leveraging it to communicate back and forth. We've got that Carely community product, which I mentioned, which is now integrated into multiple electronic medical records so it can pass information freely to the families on the outside. And then we've got caregiving.com, which our hope and our vision for is to be sort of that, that beachhead or that, that sort of consumer facing part of our brand that really enables us to not only deliver technology to families, but also just the resources, the support, the products that they need, make sure that they have the information that they need at any given point throughout their caregiving journey. Um, so it's exciting to be, you know, connected to EOL and to have a relationship here because a lot of what we do is we want to amplify the work that you all, the panelists are doing. And quite frankly, probably most of the folks who are viewing this now, we want caregiving.com to be a platform that not only families can benefit from, but all the change makers, all the influencers in this space today can leverage as well to really drive that connection. Um, there's a lot of websites out there today that hold information hostage um, from caregivers. Um, many of us know them as sort of a place for mom and caring.com um, who sort of cloak themselves as, you know, we wanna, we're doing this for you, we're doing this for caregivers, but at the end of the day, what they're doing is they're holding information hostage and we wanna democratize that process. Um, we wanna make it easy for people to get the things they need. So um, I drew this fancy Venn diagram in, uh, in Microsoft PowerPoint, as you can probably tell. But it really does, for me, it, it, it exemplifies sort of what I'm saying here in this vision of, you know, really three distinct brands and products, but all working together to deliver on the same mission, which is how do we support our caregivers in society today? And how can we use technology and, and sort of a, a brand name and a, a expertise in web development to deliver on that vision? Um, so the overlap that you see between Carely and Carely Family, Carely Community is obvious. We've been doing that since day one. But when you start to see the overlap between caregiving.com and those products, that's when, you, that's when things will really get exciting um, because we can drive content through our CMS to these other platforms. So all three brands will remain independent. They have a very focused mission on their own, but they will work together because at the end of the day, we're technologists and making things interoperable is what we do best. So um, Thanks so much for putting this on. If anybody wants to learn more about what we do, you can find it on our website. You know, we talk about it a lot on social media. So connecting with us there is a good place to learn more. But um, caregiving.com slash Carely is probably your best bet. So great. Thank, Thank you, guys. It's yeah. such beautiful work. Um, and You're talking about my PowerPoint design? 
capabilities? Yeah, specifically your PowerPoint design. <laughs> um, that is up for a design award as well, folks. Um, so, you know, um, don't hold your breath. Um, but no, the, what, the, what you do produce is not only beautiful um, to look at and interact with, but the mission around it. Um, is incredible. So, and everyone listening, feel free to throw questions in the Q and A. We'll get to them after we hear from Mandy and Jethro. Um, but another person who has focused on um, creating products um, and solutions that are incredibly beautiful, but also has been one of those people in an industry that has elevated others, um, much like Carolee has and caregiving um, does, is Mandy from Keeper and talk death. Um, I remember Mandy at one point was like, oh, you should really come to the, the ICCFA or I believe it was what conference, do you want one of my passes? Cause you really should be there. And I was like, what an extraordinary person that I just met who's like, come to this conference, um, be my guest. And so Mandy, I, why don't you just take it away and show us what you've built over the years. Um, and don't worry, take your full 10 minutes where we can eat into our um, time later. Of course, thank you so much, Michael. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, so hi everyone, thank you so much. Uh, as Michael mentioned, I'm Mandy. I'm from a company called Keeper. We're an online memorial platform. I am the co-founder and the president and we started at about 2013 building this platform. And I thought probably, you know, similarly um, to Mike is, the best way to kind of get to know our products and get to know us is our founding story. Um, so our story started when I was visiting my grandfather's grave and I came across another man's columbarium. For those of you that don't know that word, it's essentially like a glass front space where people place uh, urns inside of it. And often they'll have these nice little keepsakes, just like what you see on the screen, pictures, the urn, flowers, and what stopped me in front of this one is, as you can tell on the top, there is a blank CD, you know, one of those out of the 90s that I used to make all my mix CDs out of. And it had the words uh, dad's files written on it. And um, I was obviously very curious about, I, you know, you don't see that often at all in a cemetery. So I was very curious. I did what we always do. I reached for my phone and I tried to Google the person's name. Of course, nothing came up. So I would never really know, you know, the contents of the CD. I would never know who this person was and what he did that was so important that his family was trying to store it and preserve it in the only way that they knew possible, which at the time was this technology. So all we would really know about this person was that date of birth, that date of death, and that dash in between and nothing else. And similar, and almost eerily actually at the same time, um, my mentor suddenly passed away of a heart attack. Um, and I was very, we were very close. Um, and about a month after his death, uh, the nonprofit that I was working at with him, we were putting together a memorial service for him. So I did what most of us do is I started looking to collect all the photographs and all the stories that everyone had of him. And the first place I went with this was his Facebook profile. But unfortunately, I couldn't find it anymore because his family had taken it down. And um, I realized I didn't actually have much else like on my own personal computer about him, except for maybe a couple photos, you know, I may have, have taken, but really everything was on social media and he was active on it. So, you know, this experience was really hard because I lost someone very important to me, but it was even harder because I feel like I lost all those memories of him again. And it's like having, it's like having that second death that, that happens when, when, you, when you, your body physically dies and then your memory dies as well. So this experience made me realize that we're always sharing our stories on social media, on online forums, we're engaging with other people's stories on blogs and on podcasts. But then when it comes to the conclusion of our own lives, our stories are often frozen in that last social media post. Our favorite moments are you know, maybe on a friend's smartphone or maybe on our smartphone that can't be unlocked. And um, our stories live on often silently just in the memories of our loved one. So our um, response to that was 
to Found Keeper, which is a collaborative and interactive storytelling platform that allows families to fill in that dash uh, with memories and tributes and photos and genealogy. And um, our focus was really to enable communities to come together and help create what we like to call the quilt effect, where everyone has their little piece of that person and they share everything they have to create this whole story, this whole picture. And we found that just that process becomes extremely healing for families while they're grieving a loss. And lastly, we wanted to spark curiosity. That moment when I was at the cemetery, it was really, the thought was, what if I could walk around the cemetery and learn about the story of every single person here? And, um, you know, one of the quick solutions that we came up with was our mobile app that we currently have that's completely being redone. So you can download it now, but it'll get even better. Um, where you can just take a picture of a monument, it'll read the name on the monument and it'll bring up the story. And also working with interesting technology like augmented reality as well. And so we work with um, lots of different types of organizations. And we really started working directly with families. So you could even go onto mykeeper.com, create a memorial page for a loved one that has passed away. We still do that today. And then as we evolved, we added some enterprise solutions. So it's a full tool set, like uh, we do for funeral homes and cemeteries uh, particularly. And then more of this year, we started actually working with hospice and palliative care centers. And it really becomes like a whole kind of uh, tool set, which as you can see on the bottom has online memorials. It even has a whole kiosk center, which is great, you know, particularly in a cemetery when you're looking for directions, the mobile application, as I mentioned, then we even have a direct email marketing service uh, or email tool that can be used for marketing or just for communication. Um, and to touch on hospice and palliative care, and specifically because, you know, many of you are, are here from those spaces, is we actually first started working with hospice because um, a few hospice centers came to us saying we need to host a memorial service because they typically host a few memorial services every year. And they weren't able to do that because of COVID. So they started using our platform to plan these events, have them virtually, and then be able to um, share these pages with families to then, you know, commemorate their loved ones online. Instead of, you know, being there in person and lighting a candle, they can do all of that through our platform. And then other end of like pra practitioners, like uh, even like death doulas and uh, even folks who are doing um, end of life care more on an individual basis, um, we actually, even just yesterday, actually, we launched an update to our platform that allows um, end of life practitioners like death doulas to essentially use our system um, to create pages for people who are going to pass away, who are, who are reaching that end of life or who have already passed away. And so what we did is we created um, like a level down from the enterprise solution where you don't need this whole massive tool set, but you still want to use our solution. So we've created that as well available on our website. Um, and one of our most exciting projects um, as of recently has been some government projects where we're working with the Department of Veterans Affairs and the National Cemetery Administration to memorialize um, right now almost 5 million veterans in every national cemetery, so about 160 cemeteries, and we're adding new cemeteries um, almost every week. And so that's just an amazing thing that we've been able to do, again, especially during COVID when Memorial Day and coming up very soon, Veterans Day, you can't memorialize, you can't go to the cemetery as much, they're not holding the services. So being able to ensure that a veteran's story and the sacrifice that they made for their country never dies is very important. And so we're really proud to be part of that project. It's called Veterans Legacy Memorial. You can go online and check it out. And then we also work with nonprofits and corporations who are also trying to help memorialize their community and even their employees that they can actually come together as a group and do that through our system. 
And just to kind of show you a few of the quick features. So of course, everything starts with storing and, and sharing that life story and adding photographs and videos. Um, so similar to what Carly does, we're also using very you know, social media concepts so that families understand how to use it, but also to improve interactivity so that you can add comments, you can like things, and you can really engage with it. You can send and receive tribute messages. This is where a lot of the collaboration happens, where you can leave a message, share photographs, and then it all gets added into what we call the mementos album. You can build your full family tree. We're not trying to be ancestry here. The goal is really to be able to list out your family tree and write the story behind everyone. So for example, if you clicked on one of those names, it would actually bring you to their page. So it lets you actually slowly build out your whole tree and your whole family history. Of course, we have lots of really uh, robust privacy settings. As much as it's beautiful to share your life story, not everyone wants their loved one's information available to the world. So that's an option that um, has been very important to us. And then, um, as mentioned, cemetery directions or final resting place directions. That's a really uh, one of my favorite tools uh, that we've built is you can't really tell, but on the map, it was actually the exact coordinates of that person's resting place. So the latitude and longitude. And so this can work in a cemetery where you would get what where you would go on our app or on the desktop and uh, it would just essentially bring up Google and give you directions because cemeteries are really large and really confusing. But also thinking about families who are scattering the remains of their loved one. If you're going out into the middle of the ocean, it's kind of hard to remember exactly where you were, where you scattered your loved one's ashes. So you can simply just use your phone on our app and just save that exact location or in a park, wherever it may be. And then that way you always can revisit if you'd like to. Um, another important piece that I just wanted to talk about now because it's been used it's been used a lot during COVID is we have event pages that are connected directly to the memorial page and it enables you to have a virtual event or an in person event or one that's actually a combo if you have a small funeral service for only immediate family and then you're having it streamed online. Um, that's all available to manage through our platform. Um, and it can be for a public event or a private event. Guests can RSVP, uh, really use that, the full service. And then one of the last things I wanted to talk about was the pre-need section, which um, again is super important for hospice and palliative care when um, a patient is reaching their end of life. And you know, we've been talking to a lot of hospice volunteers um, and just the stories that they hear from the patients that they serve, because they're with them almost you know, every day. And they show them photographs, they tell them stories. So the goal is to really be able to build out your own legacy before you pass away. We have all of our, we have thousands of pictures on our phones, or you have all these photo books. Um, and the goal is to start building out your story in the way that you would want to be remembered. And then you can assign your keeper, which is the reason behind our name, to be the keeper of your page to manage your memorial page um, for when you pass away. So I know I went through all that really fast, but um, feel free to check out our site. And um, I, that's my direct contact if you guys have any questions. Thank you so much. I love it. Thank you, Mandy. Um, I can see just watching Sylvia's face take it in is was is a thing of beauty, um, and just just see the immediate impact that your work has on people. Um, well, it's that uh, last uh, trip in Uruguay. I went to the cemetery to see the place where the, my father is with my daughters, and we got lost. We had to go back, ask where was it. And, Having that, I think, in my phone here with, um, I don't know, feeling the connection in some so far away, I, I think I love it. Thank you. It's, it's, it's so beautiful. Um, and we will share um, all of the social handles and any contact information that our um, three founders would like to all of the attendees and people that RSVP'd. And this um, will be available at the same link um, where you went to find, you know, to RSVP after the event as a video. So you can share it with people um, as well. So the, um, we're, we're moving over to Jethro for our last 
um, founder. And Jess was one of those people that literally for five or six years, um, people would say, you don't know Jethro, you need to meet Jethro. You are doing such um, s similar and complimentary work in the world. Um, I knew about the Hello Game. And then we got to meet finally about a year ago. Um, and uh, just honored to know you, my friend. Um, I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you everyone for attending and uh, uh, Mike and Mandy are hard folks to follow. Uh, I neither have a presentation um, nor a cool background. Um, so um, I, my name is Jethro Heiko. I am founder, um, CEO of Common Practice. I work really closely with an awesome designer and my business partner, Nick Jalen, uh, who is the lead designer of our game. We've worked together for 22 years. Um, we haven't seen each other for many months and actually tomorrow we're gonna meet for some social distancing uh, partner meeting. Um, so I'm excited. Um, I'm very much a social person, not surprising uh, given what we've created with the Hello Game. Uh, so this uh, COVID uh, for me and I'm sure for some of you also been challenging uh, just on that and many other reasons. A um, little bit of background. Uh, I got really interested in talking about end of life issues, serious illness as a young person. Um, I think that was um, just the way I was raised, talking about you know, issues, things that were often avoided was something that, uh, let's just say there wasn't much avoided uh, in my uh, upbringing uh, in terms of conversations. And then that came in quite handy when my father was diagnosed uh, with a, a, a terminal cancer uh, when I was 20, he was 53 at the time and died of stomach cancer. Um, and we had a really great sort of relationship and a lot of conversations about um, his life, his death, um, and uh, just caring for someone at the end of their life is just really important work. And uh, when we had an opportunity a few years ago, well now seven years ago, to uh, think about what we could do to support caregivers, we thought, well, those kind of conversations are just so important. How do we help people have them? Um, and we were particularly thinking about, uh, particularly we call them uh, a cruise director in a family, often a, a woman, often middle-aged, who kind of took care of the family. Not They may themselves have been a direct caregiver to a loved one, but they also sort of held down the schedule, planned the reunions, thought about who's going to come to Thanksgiving dinner, um, you know, all those sort of uh, often invisible roles that uh, women play that in families that really are just so important to holding families together. And we thought, well, what could we give them, what could we create for them that they could introduce so that they didn't have to like hold the whole conversation, uh, but they could introduce the conversation. So we thought, well, what is the kind of thing that families might want to do? Um, and we came up with, with a game, uh, which I'll be honest, the first few years people thought we were crazy. Um, they're like, a game? Isn't this a serious topic? And like, yeah, and my response is always, yeah, it's so serious, it needs a game. Um, and uh, basically the game is very simple. It's an analog game. So I love that I'm, we're, I'm part of a tech for healthcare um, uh, presentation here and we're very low tech. Um, the game is, a, it's a physical product. It looks like this. Um, it's got pieces like any game and, and um, booklets with questions. But the, the technology in some ways is the technology that all humans have, you know, the technology of conversation, uh, the, com the, the technology of um, listening to someone else, expressing gratitude for what someone contributes, uh, acknowledging their identity, acknowledging their goals, uh, giving space for people to have permission to, to share things that are risky, uh, that might make them feel uh, kind of icky or vulnerable. Uh, but still getting support for it. So that's the game is sort of, is the, a lot of people think that the, uh, I'll, I'll get into sort of the, the specifics of the game in a moment, but a lot of people think it's the, the questions in the game, but actually it's the, 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 why, the reason why the game works um, so effectively, oh, my, one of my children, um, uh, is that human beings are awesome. I mean, amazing and capable of incredible things if given an opportunity to really listen to each other. Um, so uh, I'll stop for a moment and just get my thoughts together in terms of what's important to share. Um, following the death of my dad, I also ran a bereavement program. Um, and part of that program was really attract, was, the goal was to attract young people to 
bereavement services, not an easy sell for young people. Um, and what I learned very quickly was that people really want to talk about end of life issues. Uh, they often just don't have the permission or the structure. Um, so when we came to designing the game, we thought a lot about permission and structure. Um, and basically the game is a booklet like this. It's uh, 32 questions. Uh, I'll just read, I'll read one or two questions so you get a sense of what kind of questions a group of people would answer. Um, question six, what activities make you lose track of time? Uh, so imagine five people at a kitchen table or on Zoom, each taking the time to write down their response when they're done writing, then sharing with each other. You can always pass, of course. Um, or question 11, in order to provide you with the best care possible, what three non-medical facts should your doctor know about you? So again, so I think a lot of times the reason why people avoid end of life discussions is because they think it's talking about death. Uh, the game is really all about talking about living and dying well mm -hmm. with an emphasis on the living well. Or question 15, I think this speaks um, somewhat to Keeper um, and the work we learned about from Mandy. If only one story is told at your memorial service, who should tell it? You know, so I love thinking about that question because I think about my, my friend Dave, who's a librarian in New York, and he just know, he's known me forever. And I don't know what story he'd tell. But he knows that if I die, and hopefully it's not for a long time, he's, he's prepared. Like, he knows that he's going to be the guy. He's kind of shy, too. But he's going to tell just a really good story. Um, and that's just nice to think about. And I can have that time with Dave now and not, um, you know, just allows us to reflect on our lives together, which is nice. Um, also, during the game, you exchange thank you chips, which are these little blue chips that say thank you on them. So it's a way to physically manifest gratitude. Uh, of course, COVID made it really challenging because we were we had shared this game with the world and we had health systems and religious institutions and people really all over the world uh, with a lot of success, particularly in the U.S. and Canada, playing the game, and including in large group settings, like at conferences, I mean, 300 people in a room at tables of five or six people playing the game. And then, of course, COVID hits and it's sort of challenging. So uh, before I and I wanted to be sure that people understand that they, they can play Hello. We've created an abbreviated version of Hello, of course, called Hi, uh, which is the first eight questions of the game. It's free. Uh, and it's not high tech. It's really a three-page, four-page document that you download uh, and you use any video chat platform uh, like Zoom uh, to play with anyone you'd like. Uh, again, it's really great for like groups of five or six people. But if you have a family of eight or 10 people, you could play, you know, uh, if you're scattered across the country, as many of us are now, or the world, you can still play um, by video. And the instructions adapt some of the rules so that it still makes sense, uh, even if you're not in person. Uh, so that's high. It's on our website, which is commonpractice.com. It's very easy to find. And we have some other tools there and resources about uh, kind of conversation technology that I think are useful to people. Um, and I think I'll stop there uh, with just a uh, gratitude again for the opportunity to speak with you, uh, share the hello game and what we're doing um, and for the EOL collective, which is just doing great work. Um, I, so again, someone that's been thinking about these issues for, oof. oh, I forgot to mention, it's my dad's birthday today too. So this is like a nice way to celebrate that. Uh, he would have been 81 uh, today. And so to celebrate, I'm um, getting a, his favorite pie was a, lemon meringue pie. So I'll be picking up the pie with the kids uh, and doing a little birthday celebration after dinner tonight. Um, but I'll just say as someone that's sort of been interested in these topics for 27 plus years or longer, it's just really nice to see how much has happened in terms of transforming our culture, in terms of commitment, in terms of real business um, and, you know, commitment to changing the way our, our society and our world thinks about end of life, talks about it, because it really does matter in terms of how we live. So thank you. Thank you, Jethro. Um, and your your dad is getting some birthday wishes over in chat, just so you know. Uh, yeah, nice. what, thank you. Tell us your father's name, just so we can. Uh, Lance Kenneth Heiko. Lance Kenneth Heiko, and we have um, looks like Christina Clugston's mom's birthday today. Uh, oh, cool. Happy birthday. We would have been 74. Um, my, my father's um, death anniversary is coming up on Halloween of all days.
place. Um, so these, these important dates um, and so important for us to remember to celebrate them. Um, so let's, um, I'm gonna turn it over. I think Sylvia has a couple questions for our panelists and then also just reminder um, to folks, if you've got questions, um, it is important to say their names. Um, if you've got questions, sorry, I was doing a little reading of the chat and talking at the same time. Um, but if you have questions for anyone here today, go ahead and put it in Q&A, um, not so much in chat because we might miss it. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to Sylvia. Yeah, so first of all, uh, a comment to, for Mandy, uh, that sometimes we in medical care doctors, we don't think about our own mortality and our own way to celebrate our family members because we are made to help others. So I think uh, bringing this type of tools uh, that are engaging, uh, I think it's going to help us to get to our own uh, families. Uh, I think we should all be open to this type of things instead of thinking always, oh, what go is good for our patients, right? It's, it's for us. Uh, so I, I thank you for that. I, I think actually I'm thinking to do it with my, my siblings. Um, and uh, for hello and clearly as a physician and a doctor sometimes in the ICU when the patient cannot speak and having the family members in the same page, I cannot stress enough how important it is. So I think both of your technologies and, and proposals are helping us not to have this problem, what we say the sister from California here in Ohio, like everything is set, all the plans, and then the sister comes, uh, and then because he was not in contact with the patient, didn't know what was going on, they changed all the plans, and we have to start again discussions and talks and suffering. And so my question to both of you um, is um, how you have think about empower these people that after having the conversations or um, we carry um, how to connect with the healthcare, provi healthcare providers because sometimes what I feel is like uh, sometimes um, there's a disconnection between us here in the ICU or in the floors with patients and what's going on in the family so sometimes we are open to explore but sometimes how, how your uh, proposal can help that connection. It, so, to, and I'll, I'll just give you sort of a real quick answer. I'd love sort of Mandy's um, opinion on it too, because I, I imagine hers is a little more asynchronous, which I think could probably be more valuable in this case. But so it's it's several levels. Right now, staff in an ICU are so burdened by the number of systems they have to use as it is that us introducing another system to communicate with family is almost a non-starter. So, so that's the first thing I sort of always lay out there that in that type of acute setting, we would never sort of position Carolee as like, hey, nurses and physicians, you, so you should use this to talk to families on a regular basis. But I think where we see the value typically delivering um, and, and really making an impact is, is again, empowering the family to be better communicators amongst themselves. Because oftentimes in the situation you just described, you guys are communicating very directly to a single family member about what's going on, decisions that need to be made, conversations. And often then that conversation is going in a game of telephone in 17 different directions. Text over here, email over here, seven phone calls to seven separate family members over here. And there's no cohesion, no one's on the same page, and it doesn't, it doesn't help anything. And quite frankly, it often causes more stress and confusion where we see the benefit is if everyone's on the same platform and the stream of messages is not only in the same sort of chronological order, but it's organized based on topic, you've, you've leveled up the playing field so significantly just in that, just in that respect. Um, so that's, that's where I would see it sort of really indirectly positively impacting the healthcare providers is if, if a family is doing a good job communicating, it often will lessen the burden on the healthcare staff in order to, to pick up the slack. That's totally true. And I thank you not to uh, put us uh, to search something else or answer any other message. 
we we typically look for integrations as our way to sort of capture information from you guys. So w that's why we integrate with like electronic medical records in many cases is rather than have staff have to duplicate entry a message over here in this system and then put it in ours, we just rather grab the information from where it is you're already putting it okay. in many cases. Yeah. That sounds great. But Mandy, from your perspective, I, I think asynchronously, if we can capture stuff as a pre, for a pre-need perspective and also from a planning perspective, I imagine that there's a lot of value there. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that's how we work with most of our um, larger providers is let's say it's a hospice or even a cemetery. Just like you mentioned, Mike, we always will, our first goal is to understand what systems they're using and try to integrate to them because duplicate entry is more work for people. It, there's human error. So that's really one of our first steps. Um, and then after that, because we have the concept of the keeper where there's multiple managers that can exist, that's really where, you know, let's say this is the hospice uh, that wants to offer this to families or even a hospital. They want to offer this to families. They would simply be able to just send them a link or a form in that intake process or at maybe the first meeting with the social worker. And then it's really up to the family because especially, you know, not every family wants to use it, right? So we have to respect that. So the family would simply start that process, but because we do it, you know, on the technology side, kind of with tokenized links and things like that, what we're able to do is we're able to have the organizations or the hospice, the hospital always connected to it and always have any access that they need, but it's really on the families to be able to go in and manage it and add to it. And then when you have patients who don't have as much family or just don't have someone in their life that's that you know is comfortable with technology, that's really where, especially in hospice where volunteers come in, a lot of the hospice workers or the associations that we've spoken to, they are looking for volunteers to do things. They're looking for volunteers to do projects. A lot of them wanna do legacy projects, but they don't even know where to start. You know, they can try to put pictures together and write some text. But what we do is we just kind of make all of that information gathering simple. And so that's really our goal where, you know, even just volunteers can have access to it to just sit with the patient and, you know, go through the photo books. And if the patient can even speak a little bit, just record their story around that photograph as an example. That's awesome. That's beautiful. That's awesome. And we are, um, <clears throat> because we only have about six minutes left, I'm going to leave, uh, I'm going to ask one more question from our three panelists. But before I do, um, um, one quick uh, note is our next town hall is November 19th, same time. Um, we have a few um, equally amazing guests. Um, we'll be joined by um, BJ Miller to talk about his new organization, Metal Health. Um, and we'll be joined by Shoshana Ungerleiter, the founder of Endwell, who will be talking, taking us on a kind of um, behind the scenes tour of Take 10, which is December 10th, um, Endwell's big event this year. Um, and then um, the founder of Vinca, um, who's, they're doing a great job um, really modernizing the process around both pulse and advanced care directives. So pretty incredible November session as well. The one thing that I'll, one question I'll leave the panelists with, um, go ahead and um, put stuff in Q and A and our panelists can answer um, as well. Um, but one question um, with a little bit of framing, I think that a lot of the people that have inspired me, um, a lot of my mentors, um, in the end of life space um, were formed during another um, health crisis and that was the AIDS crisis. Um, and I think a lot of compassionate care, a lot of end of life care and inspiration came from that really difficult time um, in, in the United States and globally. Folks like Ira Bayok and Katie Butler, um, Frank Ostaseski, like really their model of care was formed in response um, to so many lives impacted um, during that era. So I would ask our three panelists, just what is one thing that you've learned um, from COVID, um, this COVID era? Because I actually think we are watching the future of care being formed right now in this complete you know, disaster that we're living through. So what is one thing 
It could be personal, it could be professional, it could be impacting what you're gonna build in the future, or what you already have. Um, and then we'll, uh, then we'll hear a little Bach and we'll see you all next month. You want me to go first? Uh, for, since I was the first presenter, I guess that makes sense. I, um, I, I think the biggest thing we're learning and recognizing in, across long-term care, I think specifically, is that um, the, the ability to sort of sweep communication, transparency under the rug is no longer an option for a lot of providers. Um, the, the requirement now, I think, from families and consumers to be open and communicating everything that's going on on a regular basis is going to be the standard now, um, where I think a lot of organizations could get away with, you know, sort of communicating via newsletter once a month to the family on the outside. It's not, it's not going to suffice. Um, and as a result, either you're good, we're going to have to adapt to, you know, technology or adopt technology to make our, make the process more efficient and actually doable, or we're just going to have to staff it uh, a little bit more aggressively. Either way, I think it works. Uh, human communication is just as good. Um, but I think providers are going to have to take a really serious look at their communication protocols or communication strategies and really level up uh, significantly in order to meet the demand of consumers coming into the space. Thank you. Um, I would and, say what yeah, I would say what I learned, um, which is something that we've always kind of known because it was part of our model and why we started in the first place. But the fact that people couldn't be together and memorialize someone after a death, it really showed me how important it is to people to, to come together in community when someone close to them dies. Um, and we didn't realize how important it was to the point where, you know, a client would be having just like a really like small um, hiccup on the platform. It just wasn't sure to use something and it felt like the end of the world to them. And like, it was just so important for them to, to be able to share it properly and to get it out properly. And um, it's something that we noticed particularly during, um, during this time. And so really I would say overall, it's the need to be connected to those that we love, especially during, um, what, what, when you lose someone. Thank you, Mandy. And Jethro, take us out. Oh, um, I thought of questioning assumptions. Uh, I think uh, we actually had some research that came out recently about our game that showed that there's a large national study showing that African-Americans uh, want to talk about end of life and do so as willingly as, as um, white Caucasian folks. And I think that that was a huge assumption um, that actually has impacted negatively healthcare and, and creates the healthcare disparities. And I think just given COVID and, uh, you know, efforts to end racism in our country are, are really connected. Um, and I think, and, and if, if COVID doesn't, the experience of it doesn't question our assumptions <laughs> about what's important to us, then we're not paying attention. So I think just generally we need to question what we think more, more often. I want to add to your study that we just studied our program here at the pre anesthesia clinics with advanced directives and we were able to close the gap. 80% of the patients now signs the document independently of the age or zip codes by geolocation. So uh, it's, it's that, it's the education and, and we are the ones we have to offer the, the information to everyone in order to decrease the disparities. I, I totally agree with you. And I think what we have learned is that when the health crisis comes, there's not, nothing is protecting anyone, right? Uh, so we are all uh, vulnerable to this, to this virus and very simple uh, steps. So I, I encourage everyone to use a mask and keep social distancing. I think this is what we have learned as, uh, as the world, to get connections, real connections, and between people to keep us connected and, and, and alive and, and also to protect ourselves and others using the mask and social distancing. So thank you. Thank you everyone and thank you Sylvia for the important um, reflection and reminder. Um, we'll, we'll see you all next month. Thanks for spending the whole hour with us. Oh and there's Bach to take us out.